<laughs> yeah, I think we're good to go. All right. So well, I'll we'll turn it over to you. And um, thanks again for uh, providing this demonstration. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. So um, I'll introduce myself, talk about kind of the quick agenda, and, and be happy to kind of take interactive questions uh, as we do. Um, so my name is Harris Kamal. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for um, Medi Ledger's network uh, that's administered by Chronicled. I'll we'll kind of explain kind of how that works as well. Um, my background has been in life sciences for the last 17 years, typically in startup scenarios, working in the supply chain, um, and then a bit of a pivot here to chargebacks. And we will explain what chargebacks is as we get, get into this um, for us. And uh, obviously, this is not a technical uh, discussion today. Today, I'm going to be focused on kind of the business case um, and the business reasons of what um, we delivered as, as a solution. That is, in fact, powered by blockchain in the back. Um, I think there's some background noise, Jeff, that just started. Oh, it's gone. Okay. It's gone? Okay. Go, no problem. So um, with that, I'm going to kind of jump in and, and kind of talk about what it is that we were built to do. So we are, basically are looking to streamline financial transactions for the life sciences industry. So we had to pick a place to start. And what we were doing... You know, and, and I'll be uh, very uh, honest with you guys. There was a time where I was a blockchain naysayer, where it seemed like blockchain was just a panacea for every single thing that we could ever think of, um, whether it was tracking our products in the supply chain or uh, tracking sneakers on a sneaker exchange to make sure that they're authentic, right? It was all blockchain uh, powered information. What the reason I joined Betty Ledger um, is because I really felt that we were on to a very um, precise business case that actually leveraged the blockchain in the right way uh, for the right thing, solving the right problem. And what we found, you know, in in as we look into healthcare, and, I, and I'm life sciences, worked in pharma, across distribution and, and so forth, is that there's a trillion dollars spent each year in just the administration uh, of our of our of our healthcare. Now when we get into kind of it from a systems perspective, what you'll find is that, you know, as like any supply chains go, there is manufacturers, there's distributors, and there's consumers, dispensers, hospitals, pharmacies, um, and, it, and, and very similar to any supply chain, right? They're those equal participants. The problem happens in these supply chains is that there's this perpetual misalignment of data. It's just really simple things, right? Is that, you know, um, in our, as we get into our use case, we'll talk about, you know, um, group purchasing organizations, distributors, and manufacturers, but their data has to align in order for these financial transactions to take place, right? So it's as simple as, you know, Harris wants to send money to Jeff. Do we both know each other's unique identifier? Can we align on that? Or do we both call each other something different, right? Does um, pharma uh, manufacturer like Pfizer call a drug a certain name? Um, when it gets to the distributor, they call it something else. When it gets to, you know, the hospital system and the pharmacy, maybe they refer to it as something else. And what happens is, is when you're trying to conduct any financial transactions, that data misalignment ends up in errors, as you can imagine, right? So you submit, whether you're buying something, returning something, any transaction you want to um, engage in has to be aligned, right? You both have to understand who is the party buying it? Who is, what are we buying? When did we buy it? What price are we eligible for based on our, our profiles? And that misalignment re leads to what we call revenue leakage. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But what the industry has done all along to solve these problems is just throw more people at it, right? We've, we've not leveraged technology much um, as we um, engage in life sciences. Strangely enough, we're probably so uh, innovative when it comes to product development in the pharmaceutical manufacturing arena, but really not so when it comes to technology and, and leveraging technology in order to conduct business. So what is happening right now is that there's a number of transactions that are supported with these financial transactions, and we'll talk about chargebacks, are supported by EDI, which is an age-old technology, quite frankly, has been around, I think, since the 70s. Um, it's not you know, uh, an intelligent technology. It doesn't really validate data. It doesn't make sure that there's any business rules enforced or anything of that nature. Um, what happens is, is that when you're doing that, it's, it's not real time. It's, it doesn't have any alignment factors in terms of making sure that we're all referring to something um, as the same thing. 
takes weeks and days, you know, in manual reconciliations to get it get it done. What we're moving uh, the industry towards, and we call it a bit of an industry movement, is automation, um, lowering their costs, and making it real time. And what we'll do is we're looking to basically offer um, a solution that's much like a clearinghouse. So what that means is, is that us as the administrator of the Medi Ledger network, right? There's a number of participants in it, distributors, group purchasing organizations, and manufacturers. We act as a clearinghouse, meaning um, when that information is submitted, we've kept and aligned the data outside of your four walls. So what the distributor calls the drug, what they refer to you as a customer, what pricing eligibility they had is now aligned. People spend tons of money to do it inside their four walls. But what Network 2.0 allows you to do is have a shared sense of the what we call the source of truth, right? So there's a source of truth for membership IDs, uh, your identifiers. There's a source of truth for what the product is called. There's a source of truth for the contract and the pricing uh, available for those drugs. And once we, with the Network 2.0, that level of technology allows us to align all the participants in the financial transactions so that it can be done in real time, so that it can be automated so that something like a blockchain can enforce business rules that say, hey, if these conditions are met, this transaction is legitimate and should flow through the system. So that is kind of the intent. Um, a little bit about our background. Um, I think it's really in interesting to see how we came together. This is um, a platform and a network that was built by the industry for the industry. So a number of collaborators uh, inside it, large manufacturers. Um, if you know much about the uh, distribution of pharmaceutical products in the U.S., you know that McKesson, Cardinal Health, and Marisource Bergen, who is now called Syncora, um, rebranded themselves, um, control about 90% of the supply. So products are being purchased, moved, um, delivered. Cardinal McKesson or Marisource Bergen are likely one of the uh, distributors behind it. Uh, there's other um, sources of information that we collaborate with called a group purchasing organization. So group purchasing organizations is basically, you know, uh, they they aggregate the spend uh, and the buying power of hospital systems, as an example, and they get preferred pricing for their um, members. So the folks that we started with are were the manufacturers, the wholesalers, and the group purchasing organizations. And this industry came together over a number of years. They created a, a working group. We actually started um, in a working group that was dedicated to the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. And that was for the track and trace of uh, products um, and the requirement to verify that that product was not counterfeit and that it was legitimate um, throughout the supply chain. So we were um, a participant in that and one of our products supported that. And that industry working group, as they were getting together, they said, look, this is really interesting that we are, you know, solving this compliance issue with uh, a blockchain based technology for track and trace. What we really would believe is an issue is this issue with chargebacks. And we should look at what we can do to solve this problem that we have. And a chargeback, I'm going to explain here. And so they, they had us look at this. So a chargeback occurs this in this way. In if some of us are probably old enough to remember rebates, where we used to buy an item and have to fill out um, a piece of paper, tell you what, uh, attach our receipt, tell you what product we bought, and mail it in within 30 days to get our rebate back. Right. So think of it in that context. What happens here is is that um, a distributor like Cardinal Health, for example will purchase drugs from Pfizer. And let's just call it at $100 a vial. Now, what happens is, is that they will then end up selling that to a hospital system that's part of a group purchasing organization. But that group purchasing organization has made a deal and has a contract uh, for their members with Pfizer that says, hey, I get this for $80. So of course, the distributor has now bought it for 100. They fulfill the order at $80. And what they do in order to make themselves whole again is go and submit a claim to Pfizer that says, hey, I sold this drug. Uh, I referenced this contract. It was for this group purchasing organization member. So they got this uh, pricing at $80. I bought it at $100. Here's the member's ID. Here's my contract ID. Here's all the information you need. I'm submitting it. Please give me my $20 back. 
And so that is in fact what a chargeback is. So a, a very specific term within our within our community, but there's $90 billion worth of these transactions uh, going on every year. If you look on the annual reports for Pfizer or J and J, they actually have it as a line item. You know, it's the, uh, you know, for I, th I think for Pfizer it was like nine billion dollars uh, on it that they that they reserve in cash flow for this particular transaction, um, and and it makes a big impact on their bottom line. Now the issue here is that you with the current system, four percent of those chargebacks are in error meaning they will basically end up in a dispute. So uh, Cardinal will submit it um, and Pfizer will deny it and say, guys, you're outside of your submission window or you did not reference a contract or, hey, th that, that person you sold it to was not eligible for this pricing. So I'm going to deny that chargeback. And they're misaligned, right? And it could be that, hey, they didn't get the contract price updated in time. They didn't get that member associated to that contract in time because it's not in real time right now it's using email and EDI at, at best. And they'll dispute it. They, they have, you know, Cardinal has hundreds of people dedicated to resolving this um, dispute. Pfizer has a team of people that does the same. And at some point, they will either agree that one of the parties was wrong and issue the chargeback, or they could agree to disagree and settle the claim, maybe at 50%, or um, they completely write it off. And that is what ends up in uh, the revenue leakage that's costing the industry about four to $10 billion a year. So that is what it is that we've kind of focused on. Um, and hey, Harris? Yeah, hi Tom. Ken Klein, quick, quick question. Was there Please. any sort of clearinghouse um, in place or any sort of mechanism to aggregate this data previously? Or is this brand new? Everything was point to point previous previously. This is brand new. We we really don't have another aggregator of sorts or a network of sorts in in play when it comes to chargebacks. Okay, got it. And I'm just what I'm rolling around in my mind is in a similar situation. Walmart Canada, uh, they had disputes of seventy percent <laughs> um, mm. for shipments. And so they were able to get it down to 1%. So, uh, I mean, 4% sounds a lot lower than 70%. So I'm pretty impressed that it was only 4%, but still that's $4 billion. It's a lot of money. It, it's it's a lot of money, right? And when it comes down to the individuals, you know, we're, it's it's a matter of cash flow, right? The, the cost of capital that they can't put this capital work, it's unpredictable. So they have reserves, you know, $9 billion sitting around waiting to figure out what chargebacks are going to come in because they don't have any kind of, they, they haven't had, uh, I should say any, you know, um, thing that gave them a lot of confidence that everything that they know is gonna be paid and they don't need to keep extra reserves around. Good, thank you. So um, just to give you an idea about where this fits in, you know, um, pharma will always talk about their gross to net problem. It's an interesting, there's an, a report from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it's, I think it's called the Janssen annual, annual report though, on chart. Um, on, on this. And what they do is they point out that, hey, drug prices seem to be going up, but it's not that the drug manufacturers are making more money uh, on a margin basis. They're actually paying more fees. They're paying more rebates. They are issuing more chargebacks. They're dealing with copay cards returns. And so their net sales, if you get gr grinded out down to uh, very little, one of the largest components of this you know, the deductions that they take is chargebacks. So that is where we where we started to get alignment from the industry with the pharma manufacturers, the distributors, and the uh, group purchasing organizations. Uh, and we've recently added health systems to the network, just, uh, just got our first one in. So um, what you'll hear us focused on is it's alignment and accuracy. That That is what it is that these folks are after. And I know this is a blockchain talk, so I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of blockchain. We we do use Substrate as our blockchain for those technical people. I'm not technical, so I won't be able to go into much detail there. Um, but that was a, a choice that we made early on, thinking that uh, many blockchains could end up connected, and uh, and Substrate gave us the opportunity to do that. We are a permission-based blockchain. Um, what we typically use the blockchain for um, is a couple of things, right? Of course, the trust, making sure that the parties are registered and we know who they are and as they're exchanging the sensitive data around drugs and pricing um, 
in those type of uh, financial transactions. Of course, the security, but the rule enforcement is what really comes into place in our network. And as I walk you through kind of how we've solutioned for this, that'll kind of come to come to bear uh, as well. So think of think of a business rule as in like, hey, um, if, if I'm you know submitting my claim for this uh, chargeback that I want for twenty dollars within my window, I've referenced a contract that the blockchain has a identifier for. It should be automatically. Um, credited back to me. So if the blockchain is doing that rule enforcement, there's no ambiguity. There, there's no person to kind of evaluate the claim. As long as it meets those conditions, that claim would be honored. And we're, again, as and I'll just point out really quickly, again, we're focused on manufacturers, distributors, and GPOs. And I will kind of talk, and, and I think we've talked about the business case a, a little bit already here, so I'm going to skip that. But what I want to point out is I'll get into a little detail about how this was happening today um, and what it is that we brought to the table and what the future state looks like for our current customers. So I've mentioned the group purchasing organizations you'll see here on the left hand side. I've mentioned the manufacturers and I've mentioned the wholesale distributors. Oh, sorry, screen change. Now, what happens today, just to give you an idea of how this whole process comes together, is a group purchasing organization basically publishes a roster. A roster is just a list of their customers that are eligible to purchase at the price that, uh, of their membership, right? So they've got a roster, a list of customers that are uh, that they are said that are on their are part of their membership, and they need to send that to the manufacturer because what the manufacturer is doing, Pfizer, Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, what they're going to do is they've got a membership team, right? They come in and say, okay, this GPO is saying that all their members are um, able to buy off of this contract at this price. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate these customers um, and I'm going to determine what price they're available for. I'm the source of truth on this contract. The GPO is this going to be the source of truth on who's on that membership list. And we'll kind of reinforce that as we go. And what happens is, is that the manufacturer gets that information in. What they'll do is they'll manually go look up the HIN database, which is the uh, the identifier database uh, for the industry that says, this is your member ID, um, this is who you say you are, or a DEA number, right? If you're purchasing uh, those class two drugs, or you're a part of the 340B program, all of these have identifiers basically that basically say, this is who you are, this is your member ID. If you're gonna be referenced in this regard, this is your reference number that determines whether you're a pharmacy, a hospital, uh, a physician, those are the identifiers that will identify you. So the manufacturer goes, they look up their identifiers and go, okay, I'm going to match up this list. Yeah, everybody has an identifier. That looks good. Now I'll deem um, through my evaluation who is eligible for, to be buying as a hospital, who's buying as a pharmacy, who's buying as a physician. That's what they call a class of trade determination. That class of trade determination tells them what price they're eligible for based on that evaluation that the manufacturer does. Now, once the manufacturer has done that, they then have to send that information um, over to the wholesale distributor because those are the ones that are uh, that need this information in order to fulfill those orders. So the next thing that happens is that manufacturer today using EDI, um, and that happens in a batch process, transit, transmits it over to the wholesaler. And the hope is that they've got all the information correct, that they've identified all, everybody that's eligible. They've identified that they all have an identifier um, on there. They identify what class of trade it is, and they get that over to the distributor in a timely fashion before anybody purchases drugs. And what happens is pricing changes, membership changes, and all of this has to be kept up to date. And that lack of real-time accuracy and, and alignment between one another, that causes the disputes. So now we get that, in, the wholesaler gets that information over. Um, it comes through typically an EDI message and they're able to say, okay, I'm gonna sell to these um, um, hospitals at this price. At the end, once they do it, they're gonna submit their chargeback using another EDI message that says, okay, guys, I've now sold this drug and this is all the information that you know that I'm supplying in order to get my chargeback um, claim accredited to me. If it all works well, they get a credit memo issued back to them uh, through another EDI message. 
So that is what happens today. So this is all manual processing. This is non-real time. This is EDI and emails. And what happens is it leads to kind of a bunch of errors. So what we did is we came up with three different modules to approach this. One, roster management, meaning that we're going to validate and make sure that everybody identifies their customers with the same identifiers, that they're all present, that they're all unified and provide a unified view for that. Um, the contract communication, we move away from email and EDI and we go into a peer-to-peer -peer network, which is real time. So as soon as a contract or a price or a member is updated on a contract and a manufacturing system, it's immediately made available to the wholesaler. And then lastly uh, is the claim adjudication, which I actually glossed over. Um, I'm going to um, talk about that in kind of the new uh, the new sense. Claim adjudication is the, what we are doing in, in terms of the wholesaler and when they submit and how they get an automatic credit. I'll walk, I'll walk through that. So... Um, I'll just take a pause really quickly just for the group if there's any questions in terms of understanding the current state or the nature of a chargeback um, before I kind of go into the actual, um, that kind of what we solution for. Real fast, Harris, what's a 340B just elevator? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. So 340B is, um, uh, is, a, is a designation for hospitals that are... Um, uh, underprivileged serving kind of a, um, they're federally sponsored to provide products to um, okay. the less kind of, um, I'm, I'm missing the word, but kind of like the, the underprivileged hospitals, right? So they get to so buy. So certain set of hospitals are designated as serving underprivileged communities. Underprivileged so, communities. There you go. Okay. And, and and so they get to buy a 340B pricing, which um, you might commonly hear Tom refer to as penny pricing. And what's it? Penny? penny 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 pricing so okay. they okay. get to buy at pennies what everybody else is paying dollars for right so <laughs> okay. it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting it's a program that's meant to kind of help uh, serve the underserved community right um but as you can imagine it's a pretty fine it's a large financial uh, obligation from the manufacturer okay Got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, my hey, Harris. hey, Harris, this is Jeff. Quick question. Uh, looking over what you had on the, the uh, prior state, I guess we'll call it. So pharma and these GPOs knew there was this massive cost associated with the whole process. So uh, I assume that they knew what that was. What drove them to finally say we need to implement technology to um, eliminate this cost? What, what drove senior management into that? Well, after X number, I guess years. Honestly, I think it, it was kind of a unique situation where we had that work group together. And I think blockchain was one of those things where I think a lot of the executives probably got a mandate to actually look into it, you know, ah, okay. and, and say, hey, are we being left behind? Are, 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 is, you know, is the red, are other industries taking advantage of this? And we're not, you know. So I think blockchain at that point in time, a couple of years ago, had that cachet that said, hey, we should take a look so we don't get left mm -hmm. behind here, you know? So we had that working for us. And honestly, we we had that working group um, that was driven by a compliance requirement in the Supply Chain uh, Security Act, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. So it was just that group going, looking at what the power of blockchain should do and seeing that rules could be enforced. And they had kind of colleagues, uh, you know, kind of adjacent to them in the chargeback space that thought, oh, this, this this might be the place for it, right? This might okay. be a real business case. Um, and, and so we kind of pivoted with that working group. And that working group, it took a lot of time, I will tell you. Um, pharma is a risk-averse industry, right? They do not gravitate to new technology very quickly, especially something that's unknown like a blockchain network. So there's been a lot of proving ground, I would say. Um, it's taken years to get these uh, folks comfortable uh, to the point where they're going live and scaling at, at this point but it is a long arduous uh, That's interesting point yeah okay yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's not it is not easy to get farmer to move in, in this direction i'll be really very honest with you I, if i had to do it all over again i'd probably have a lot less gray hair you know but um it's a uh, it, it's it's certainly challenging but yeah there was there was certainly some interest in blockchain and Look, I think what happened is, is that the, the juice was worth the squeeze, right? They, they realized how much revenue is being lost. Um, if, you, if you take a, a, just a snap at their audits, if you look at um, a company like 
J and J and say that they do fifteen billion dollars worth of chargebacks when they do their audits. Um, and and this is not specific to J and J, Eli Lilly or Pfizer. One percent of their audit of their of what they paid out could be an error that they should have never paid, right? But they don't have you know the the ability or the the tools in place to look at every single transaction and scrutinize it without going through that manual effort and that dispute resolution that's super costly. So if you're doing you know ten billion dollars in um, chargebacks and just one percent of those you pay an error, that's a pretty large number to get after. So we're able to kind of build this based on the ROI. So what we've been effectively able to do to get these folks to really engage is build out that ROI model for them. So we do a lot of modeling on terms of, hey, how many chargebacks do you have? What is the size of your chargebacks? What are your error rates? We take that all the way down um, and provide a business case down to the PL level of, of what they could recover. Okay. So that, yeah. is, um, that is how we've engaged them. Thanks. So um, I'm going to make sure I'm not running short on uh, time here. So 930. And this is what our network looks like. OK, so once again, you'll see the GPOs, you'll see the manufacturer and you'll see the wholesaler. Uh, the network includes um, the HIN, DEA and 340B is integrated into our network. So it looks like when you talk blockchain, um, a manufacturer has a blockchain node. So does a wholesaler. So does a GPO. But we also have nodes for these identifiers. And the reason for it is this, is that the GPO is now going to publish their roster and they're going to say, hey, these are my members and this is who I believe is eligible for these contracts. I'm going to send it to the manufacturers and the wholesalers. But what is happening here before that data gets into the network is that it is doing simple rules. I could say is at least one identifier present for each one of your members, because without that, we can't really conduct any transactions, right? So we, it's checking and says, hey, one identifier is present. Then it says, okay, if it's a HIN one, let's check with the HIN and make sure that it's still up to date, that this is not expired um, you know, or dormant or uh, has changed, for example. So it's doing that. The network is doing that check for you. And it gives back the GPO, the validations. It says, okay, everything looks good. That data can flow through the network. If it doesn't look good, it stops it at the GPO's doorstep, right? Now... We have rules, if you can imagine, that can be turned on and off. But a basic rule is that, hey, we're not going to let that data go until you fix that. Hey, you don't even have identifiers for your members. You need to go and add identifiers, make sure that identifier, the system will make sure that those identifiers are valid. What, so that's the source of truth with the GPO. That's where we try to solve that problem, is to make sure that they're the ones responsible for adding those identifiers. Now, that information makes it over to the manufacturer. The manufacturer typically was going in and having to research manually and find out, are these valid data? Do I go to these th three different databases? I'll have to go to Google and do an address search before I say, hey, that roster looks good so that my team can go in and then assign um, eligibility to this within my internal revenue management system. So today, now we've automated that. So we've automated that work. The manufacturer no longer has to do that. The GPO is a source of truth. Um, they're pushing that data in. Now they've got a clean roster. It's matched up against those identifiers. What they'll do is they'll say, all right, um, I'm going to add them to my customer master, but now I'm going to determine eligibility based on my business rules. You know, um, do I believe they're a hospital? What am I going to assign? Uh, what contract and pricing eligibility am I going to assign that to? That gets done in the revenue management system, but instead of communicating it through EDI, it's through our peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, the peer-to-peer -peer network, again, is doing a couple things. It is doing a validation. It is making sure, again, that all those identifiers are there and up to date. It's making sure that that minimum contract information is there, that there's a contract identified, that it's a valid contract, that the start and end date of the contract aligns with the pricing start and end dates within the contract that's embedded within there. So it's kind of a much smarter way to make sure that all of that data that would be needed in order to con conduct a successful chargeback is actually present. So it's doing all of those checks. It does, you know, it, it can do 12 to 25 different kinds of validations depending on what rules that we've set up. But that rule is set up in order to make sure that all of that data, a complete set of data is then transmitted to the wholesaler through the peer-to-peer -peer network in real time. So if any pricing has changed or if any members have fallen on or off, 
their eligibility has changed, um, whether they're getting hospital pricing or pharmacy pricing, it's transmitted to them in real time. Now the wholesaler at this point has all of the complete information in order to success complete a successful chargeback, right? So they've got the IDs are present and they know they're good. They've been validated. They have a unified view. The contracts are coming over in real time. They know what pricing those customers were eligible for. They know what contracts they were eligible for. So hopefully they've now used all that information. So when they submit a chargeback, they're also going through a validation check. The blockchain here is actually doing the adjudication and saying, okay, Mr. Distributor, you're submitting a claim. If you submit a claim without a valid contract, it's not going through. That manufacturer is never going to see it because I'm blocking it. I'm doing the validation. If you're submitting it outside of your submission window, if you um, you know don't have a member ID present, or if that member ID is no longer valid, you know, or if that member ID was not valid at the time of purchase uh, for that eligibility, it's enforcing those rules. So those rules, if they're met, it's great. It goes through. The chargeback is done. The blockchain in our world actually issues a credit memo. So a credit memo is then instantly issued to the wholesaler, and they know that that money is going to be coming in for them, and they can account for it in their PL. So what we've done here is we've tried to identify the source of truth, right? Source of truth for members are GPOs, contract and eligibility are the manufacturers, and the distributors get a complete set of information in order to conduct a successful chargeback transaction. So that is what we have kind of established um, in the network and the solutions that our customers are using today. So um, if I didn't mention, you know, that, that I would say the leaders in this are, are folks like Sencora, Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal Health from the distributor side, FFF, a smaller supply, supplier, uh, sorry, uh, specialty distributor, um, and folks like Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, um, those uh, newer folks that have just joined like Lupin, Cipla. So we've got, you know, um, kind of a who's who of the pharma industry. I believe eight of the top 20 pharma, pharma manufacturers, the largest distributors and group purchasing organizations like Premier, MHA and Vizian uh, are involved. So really an industry movement, um, really moving us towards automation and what we believe is the right application of blockchain to the right business case. Well, hey, Harris, Tom Klein here. Quick, yeah. if you now or maybe at question time, if you could talk a little bit more about how that sausage got made. I mean, I'm, you know, to speak to your gray hairs there, I'm sure they all didn't say, oh, yeah, hallelujah, let's all get together and let's all do this. So maybe a little bit, again, not now, maybe later at questions, how that went from one and the spark generated and how they all came together, et cetera. So a lot of the governance kind of stuff there. Sure, sure. I'm happy. I'm happy to answer uh, some of that, and I'll I'll, I'll kind of go go through a couple of these things just quickly with you that might answer some of this stuff, right? Okay. So, um, what what was challenging is is that this this chargebacks kind of crosses a multiple functions, right? There's master data management, which are is a, a separate team and an organization in in these big pharma companies. There's the finance guys. Um, and then there's the guys that are actually the the con they, literally the VP of contract and chargeback management, right? So we've got to bring all these teams together. And part of the magic of bringing the work group together was truly getting them to align with their trading partners, right? Around, you know, why are we doing this? Is it, you know, increased profitability? Is it, you know, the rate of return? Is it eliminating, you know, the $30 million that are sitting in dispute for Cardinal every single day, right? Or wh whatever that number might 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 be. And we were able to kind of align on the, the ROI of this. And what you'll see is that we, you know, we anchored around the distributors, right? So it was it, this industry, you know, if the distributors are the ones saying, guys, we've got a problem here, let's get together to solve it. They've got the kind of the power to tell their suppliers how they want to conduct chargebacks. So when they, when we got together, it was, it is really um, anchored by the distributors, you'll see that, you know, for example, Cardinal has sent out a supplier letter saying, hey, guys, this is where we want to conduct chargebacks. This is the mutual benefit of being in this network. The pharma manufacturers, you know, they they um, they benefit because you could be doing unapproved chargebacks. You're involved. You have 4% error rates with us. We're always in disputes. We're always settling. We're always writing something off. 
here's an opportunity to leverage, you know, a technology to kind of bring our partnership and our customer service level up a level. So that was kind of what was driven to it. But I'll, I'm going to go back to the, the page, Tom, uh, and show you who was involved. This, to this day, we conduct a working group, right? And so every quarter we do a face-to-face, -face, but on every bi-weekly, this working group gets together and they continue to hash it out. So it has taken years, Tom, years for them to kind of agree on um, uh, on a unified protocol, right? So if you can imagine, you know, making the sausage is pretty ugly when, you know, you get a supplier in the room and you they finally figure out a, how a wholesaler sees their data or how it gets into their backend systems. And they realize, you know, and, and that's what I think is our the special sauce is our working group, is that they realize that they just look at the world through completely different eyes, right? No, no perspective for the other person's business. And this working group has been kind of that mechanism um, that brings them together. They align in terms of intercompany processes, which they've never been able to do before. It is seriously, seriously labor intensive. Um, but through that working group, we were able to build the consensus around how they would, you know, how they all would want to see what, how they would want to see a unified set of data, right? how they could all see customers through the same lens, how they could all see a contract through the same lens, you know, how they could leverage um, technology, because then if you can imagine there's a process component to this, right? When are they going to send it? How many, how often are they going to send it? What data are they going to exchange with one another? All of that had to be defined um, in order for this network to come to life. And um, to as on October 24th and 25th, Sincora, Amerisource Bergen, is hosting the next face-to-face -face, um, work group for us. And there's about 72 people across the industry that's going to be represented. And that includes Vizient, Premier, um, uh, from the um, MHA, um, from the GPOs, from the manufacturer side. It's folks like J&J, &J, um, Pfizer, Amgen, you, you name it, the um, Nova Nordisk. All of them will be in attendance, um, and obviously the wholesalers uh, are in attendance. Cardinal, um, uh, Amerisource Bergen, FFF, and they are, um, Sincor is hosting this meeting in order to kind of encourage the adoption of the network for their suppliers and making sure that the, the industry kind of knows the commitment and the movement. So it'll be interesting because the, the kickoff of the work group will be Cardinal and uh, Amerisource Bergen both kind of standing up and saying, guys, we've done a lot of work on this. We're scaling and we need you guys to come into the network. So that it is, it is long, it's labor intensive, um, but it served us well. Um, but again, Tom, I'll tell you, it's taken years, years and years uh, in order to build that level of consensus to, uh, in terms of protocols, collaboration, data exchange, um, not no easy task. Yeah, good. Th thanks for that, uh, that background there. And the, the group uh, purchasing organizations there, how how uh, how involved were they? It sounds like it's more distributors were kind of driving it, and then manufacturers, maybe the the GPOs were kind of uh, hey, we'll come along eventually. Um, no, so I would say you know Premier has uh, would be the the group purchasing or organization that's been there from the beginning. MHA was a very early uh, participant. Vizient. Um, has got involved um, later on. Um, they've been involved for the past year or so, not as early as Premier. So I would say from a group purchasing organization, Premier's fingerprints are all over this thing. Um, but certainly it was, uh, all, it, we always had GPOs incorporated into the network. I would say, um, but you know, the focus in terms of growing the network is focused on manufacturers. Got it. Okay, thanks. So I'm happy to do questions at this point. I know we're right right at that 9.45 mark. I know we started with questions, but um, happy to answer uh, any questions the group might have. Um, again, keep in mind, I'm not uh, blockchain technical, so uh, I can't go down to that that level, um, but I could speak to probably any questions you guys have about the business, the business case, um, and, and the solutioning. So Harris, this is Jeff again. I was just wondering from a support cost standpoint, how do you... Um... For the metalizer network, how do you allocate out those costs? Is there some usage fee since you don't have a crypto? There's no gas fee to use it. How do you 
who pays for what to keep the network going or, or in the future with uh, enhancements? Yeah, so um, we operate basically as a SaaS software uh, platform, right? So very similar, every participant, every GPO wholesaler and manufacturer pays an annual fee uh, okay. to participate in the in the blockchain. So kind of like a SaaS, SaaS business model is what we employ. Okay. The other question I had uh, around this is uh, Farm also now looking at the success of, of the blockchain and looking at other parts of their business to deploy blockchain for other, other parts of their business so far that are paper based and so forth and so on. For example, the actual shipment of the materials from manufacturers all the way to uh, the hospital. There, so a, no, a number of different use cases, you know, that we are looking at in terms of roadmap, you know, um, I think our first thing is there's there's actual rebates, right? There's another, there's chargeback and the rebates, they act a little bit differently. Um, kind of rebates is like more around the volume-based discounts. So that would be a, another protocol that they're very interested in kind of solving for that has very similar uh, issues and needs uh, as chargebacks. There's um, additional longer term work. Uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of interest in kind of addressing the PBM issues um, that they that they see within their um, supply chains in terms of financial transactions. So we're we're kind of focused on supporting additional financial transactions that would be appropriate for the platform. But we have had a couple of discussions um, that are in very early stages where people have been discussing, you know, uh, the role of a PBM and kind of the role of the PBM in the financial transactions um, and how you know a blockchain protocol might be able to kind of bring some efficiencies to that process. Okay. So not very early stage, but though that is one of the places where I, we've seen a lot of interest. Okay, thanks. I don't know if anybody else says any other questions out there. Feel free to ask. Hi, this is Alicia Noel again. I'm curious, not from a metallurgy perspective, but from a chronicle perspective, are you looking at working with other industries for adapting this type of chargeback program for other industries where there is a, where there are a lot of chargebacks, whether that be um, the fashion industry or food and agriculture? I can see a lot of other use cases for this type of system. Yeah, we, we have certainly kind of looked at that in terms of a longer term kind of potential uh, for the platform. There are other industries, uh, semiconductor, for example, um, that op that operate in a very similar manner. Uh, they, they also conduct chargebacks. Um, med surge health systems is kind of the natural growth path for us. So we've definitely started to look at health systems and bringing them into the network. But in terms of different verticals, Yes, uh, we, we do believe that this could be applied. It's the first thing that on our mind was we, we kind of noticed this in the semiconductor world, that there was also a very large similar pain point with similar processes. But again, uh, Alicia, that it could be you know several verticals that this could apply for it. You are, you are correct. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't see any other, this is Jeff again, I don't see any other questions. Um, okay. So well, I appreciate everybody's time. Yeah, again, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. Um, we look at how blockchain, blockchain technology is used, um, different business scenarios. So uh, again, thanks for this. Any last call for questions? Otherwise, we'll let everybody go. Again, thanks, Harris. Thanks, Julie. Thank you guys. Hope uh, hopefully that was informative and in in an interesting kind of uh, application of actually seeing a business case for blockchain. So appreciate everyone's time. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer uh, background uh, later on. Please please feel free to reach out. But really appreciate everyone's time this morning. Great. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.